So I'm Emma Watt, team leader of the projects team at Aberdeen City Council within City Growth, which is essentially economic development. And this is where the hydrogen programme for the council sits. So I've worked on a number of hydrogen projects over the past decade um, and yeah, at, at the moment lead the, the hydrogen programme. Sorry, I'm just not. Oh. Apologies, just trying to. There we go. Um, okay, so I, I'm sure everyone is aware of the significance of hydrogen at the moment. It's it's very much on government agendas in terms of being a key sector as part of any region's uh, energy transition movement. And certainly for Aberdeen, we are finding that and it's absolutely key as part of the city's recovery from COVID, of course, um, in terms of the jobs it, it hopefully will bring um, and diversification along with our oil and gas and energy industry. And people in Scotland as well are working on a number of hydrogen projects and there's areas for us to collaborate and that's something that we're looking at beyond our own city projects as well. So in terms of Aberdeen City's timeline and history or, or journey in hydrogen, um, we started with uh, a, a simple pilot project, I say simple, but 10 hydrogen buses, um, a refueling station maintenance depot. And this pilot project was to demonstrate the operational efficiencies and challenges of the hydrogen bus product and compare it to its diesel equivalents. So it was purely by chance really that we got involved in this project. Um, the majority of our hydrogen program has been funded through Europe and the Aberdeen Hydrogen Bus Project was no exception. A partner had pulled out of the high transit and high velocity project that they were called. There were two separate funding projects and Aberdeen was approached by one of the partners to join. And we had um, a lot of support internally from management. We had some uh, directors within the council that had the foresight to see that hydrogen could play uh, a strategic role in Aberdeen's evolution from the oil and gas industry a decade ago. So we were very lucky to have that management support. We also had a lot of resistance. There was concerns around safety, of course, um, and the challenges of, of operating a new product using the public as the test bed. Um, but we put all our efforts into making that project a success. And in terms of the European deliverables required for that demonstration project, we did incredibly well albeit learning a lot of challenges along the way. So the Aberdeen Hydrogen Bus Project set the scene for our hydrogen programme and from there we were able to get involved in a number of other projects, um, as I mentioned, mostly funded by EU uh, funding, but also of course match funding from the council, um, from Scottish government, UK government and um, other funding streams as well along the way. So where we felt there was an opportunity for Aberdeen was to develop our pilot projects, our, our tangible assets, um, and build a level of transport um, demand uh, and uh, a fleet of hydrogen vehicles. <clears throat> so we've gone on to, to do that over the years. Um, you'll see later in the presentation, we have one of the most varied and extensive fleets of hydrogen vehicles in Europe. So then we realised through working with various OEMs that actually you need two stations uh, in a city if you want to have, you know, build your fleet. So we built our second station with Scottish government funding um, and it opened in 2017. It's called Aix and it's in the north of the city. And again, I'll talk in a little bit more detail about the differences between our two stations a bit later on. <clears throat> we then have continued to look at different innovative uses of hydrogen as well. Um, we rebuilt our city's um, conference arena. It's called Teca, um, and it's a, a huge development site 
that has an energy centre that provides heating and cooling and power to the whole of the development. We also have an anaerobic digestion plant on that site as well. And um, it's a, another example of how we can use hydrogen because in the energy centre, there's also electrolyzer and compressor. So we can actually produce and store hydrogen uh, relatively uh, cheaply <clears throat> as a byproduct. So uh, now we've kind of at this stage, we've built this level of demand in terms of our fleet, um, looking at um, other ways to um, increase that demand and other pilot projects that we can look at beyond transport. So over the last 18 months, we've worked very closely with Scottish government and their energy transition funding uh, to look at other ways we can widen our hydrogen um, sector. So looking, of course, at widening our, our fleet um, fleet conversion within the council, but looking beyond just the council now, looking regionally with our uh, partners in Scotland, uh, such as Maori, Aberdeenshire Council, Highland and Island, and also um, looking at where would be strategic uh, refueling points throughout that region. So trying to look uh, link those feasibility studies. Um, equally as well, we're looking, starting to look into trimodal refueling, um, so marine, rail, uh, and we'll shortly be starting a, a feasibility around rail as well. This has led us to the very, very exciting position of being in the midst of a procurement to find a joint venture partner to work with the council um, over the years to come to really develop the hydrogen sector. Um, and again, I'll talk in a little bit more detail about the phased approach we're looking at for that JV procurement. So I guess the first question is why hydrogen in Aberdeen? We've obviously had a very strong oil and gas industry with a number of um, people directly employed in that in the city, but we feel that of course there's transferable skills. Um, the oil and gas industry itself is I think trying to move away from just being known as that and, and being referred to as an energy industry and it's evolving and, and actually that's what Aberdeen's doing it's evolving it's always been a city that has evolved and looked to take on different sectors look at the strength of the region of course being a port city having significant um, links to, to Europe and, and globally as well so hydrogen fits nicely with the evolution of the oil and gas industry um, for the city. It's, it's not a separate uh, task of just creating hydrogen sector. To me, it's working in parallel with um, all the companies that have remained loyal to Aberdeen and, and working together. So hydrogen now very much fits in with our energy transition plans for the city. Um, hopefully people are aware of our um, energy transition zone that's recently been launched and we're doing some master planning around that so there's been a separate limited company set up to manage that and that's to encourage companies that want to work within that energy transition climate change environment and offering them incentives to to base within a physical zone um, within Aberdeen that's near our harbour. Of course this will link into other sectors that we already have for example, our offshore wind sector, um, and as I mentioned before, our highly skilled North Sea workforce. <clears throat> so we, as part of one of our projects, it was called HITREC in European funding, love an acronym, I'm sure you know, so HITREC. Um, <clears throat> the aim of that project was to develop a hydrogen strategy for the various partners involved, Aberdeen being one partner. So this was really key for us to lay out our plans, you know, some numbers of years ago and really plan for what we want to see and deliver in the hydrogen sector. Um, I'm proud to say that actually, although the, the strategy is, is up until 2025, it was a 10 year strategy, we've actually achieved the majority of what we set out to do. So we're already looking to refine our strategy and we'll probably look to do that in alignment with our JV partner when we announce that uh, later in October. Um, and it will take on some more ambitious plans for the region, um, probably looking beyond demonstration and pilot projects. And as I mentioned, looking to that larger sector development um, and what the future can bring 
there in terms of supply chain, our fleet, um, and our, of course, our assets in the city as well. <clears throat> so as I mentioned, um, we have probably the largest and most varied fleets of hydrogen vehicles in Europe. That's quite a nice picture of our first buses, our, our single deckers. So we have demonstrated over 85 cars, vans, trucks. Um, I think currently we have about 57 operating in the city. But our journey, as I mentioned, started with uh, a pilot project to demonstrate hydrogen buses. So it was 10 single decker fuel cell buses. At that time, they were very expensive to buy at 1.2 million each. I'm glad to say the cost of these um, products has come down significantly. Of course, that can only be achieved by economies of scale and more people buying. Um, so these buses were a Van Hool product produced in Belgium and operated um, in, in replacement for their diesel counterparts by both first and stage group in Aberdeen. And the interesting part for demonstrating um, with two bus operators was because first buses are more city routes, so potentially less challenging on the product. Uh, stagecoach have more uh, country routes, slightly more demanding routes um, with more hills, for example, stop starts um, in the city. So it, it was very useful to compare um, the operational efficiency and challenges, of course, uh, that come with demonstrating this sort of product. As part of the first bus project as well, um, we built our first hydrogen production and refueling station. Um, proud to say we've had a lot of firsts um, in Aberdeen, you know, within the UK and, and Europe as well, um, at one time having the largest bus fleet in Europe. Um, but we had the UK's first production and refueling facility. London, of course, had the first refueling facility, but they chucked in their hydrogen, I think, from Europe. Um, but we wanted to produce our hydrogen locally um, through renewable sources. So we have a green tariff on that station and actually choosing the location of that refueling station was quite key in terms of looking strategically ahead. So we actually positioned the station at our council fleet depot, it's called Kitty Brewster. And um, because we understood that actually there was a lot of potential there for our fleet conversion. And at that time, our waste trucks were situated situated at that depot and we strongly felt there was a opportunity to have waste trucks in our fleet in the future and we definitely do today. We also then decided because these buses need maintained in a hydrogen safe environment to um, put the maintenance facility in the Kitty Booster fleet depot, an existing fleet shed. Um, uh, Again, it was quite challenging at that time because not many people had um, built these maintenance depots. So um, I visited Oslo, I visited London to have a look at uh, their facilities. They'd been given a bit more funding than us, so we couldn't build something bespoke. And actually we felt as a city, if hydrogen is to have a commercial viability going forward, you can't build bespoke um, facilities. It's going to need to be integrated certainly through this um, evolution with diesel, petrol, electric um, vehicles. So our challenge was to find a company to come in and guide us into how to safely integrate hydrogen maintenance into our existing fleet depot. So we worked with TUV um, and Obviously, they came over and did those important calculations. Should there have been a hydrogen gas leak and where it would collect in the roof and specified the sorts of measures we should put in in terms of physical alterations, hydrogen detectors, venting hoses, um, but also looking operationally at how that fleet shed worked. For example, the airflow coming through because of the size of the shed, the doors being open all day, um, Apologies. Um, yes, and, and of course then 
down to the safety for the staff, the processes, the training that they would need to go through um, in terms of carrying hydrogen detectors, safe working practices on the vehicles themselves, um, how they should be connected to the venting hoses when they come in, um, and obviously down to maintenance of that fleet depot as well, making sure the hydrogen detectors are working, that they're tested regularly and maintained. So we put a lot of work into looking at what we would need to make that safe. And then it's made it far easier to convert first depot and also uh, Stagecoach had some alterations to their depot as well. So we had a lot of learning that now has made it a lot sim more simple for us um, when we're looking at other bus projects. <clears throat> So the outcome of that first bus project was very successful in terms of the European funding projects, high transit and high velocity. We were the most successful uh, demonstration site within that project. Um, obviously the stats there are, um, are there to tell that story. Um, our station, for example, had over 98% reliability, um, which was absolutely incredible uh, given the kind of bespoke engineering required and uh, the level of work that went into making sure that we would have that efficiency. Uh, and we still have that from the station today. And that station is owned and operated by BOC. Um, obviously, bus operators are looking probably around 95, 97% of bus availability. We did, in all honesty, have some issues with buses um, and, and really that availability percentage at 87 percent came down to probably a couple of buses having significant issues around the batteries, pulse inverters, for example, and actually getting those uh, products over. So the supply chain is uh, something that needs to be considered uh, and having spare parts on site, for example, that need replaced or that you know, are at risk. So there was quite a lot of learning that we took from that first project. But in terms of the, the kilometres driven, the amount of passengers um, that went on the buses and of course the, the VORs, uh, the project was very successful. <clears throat> As I mentioned, we then went on to increase our vehicle fleet um, to look at both fuel cell electric vehicles and range extenders as well certainly for our hydrogen uh, um, council fleet, the range extender vans have proved to be very successful. We're now looking at waste trucks as well. We have one um, in the city and one coming soon. And also we're on to our next generation of um, hydrogen buses. So these are double deckers. We've got 15 right buses in the city and that was and these are the world first hydrogen double deckers and they're so far proven to be very reliable and very um fuel efficient in comparison to their diesel equivalents um, a few teething problems those, those are to be expected with any new technology when they arrive but certainly that the teething period compared to the first van hool project is um miles better so as I say, 15 buses, we're getting 10 more. We needed to do some considerable alterations to um, the first depot to make sure that they can now do hydrogen maintenance on their own depot. We want them to invest in their own depot, their own people to train up because we want the hydrogen buses to be part of their future. And um, we'd like to work again with Stagecoach going forward and certainly hydrogen for those more challenging routes um, is the preferable option to electric. As I mentioned, we'll be getting another waste truck in the future. And interestingly as well, we'll be getting some cargo bikes. I think during the pandemic, deliveries and um, local deliveries have certainly picked up. So this was a project we got involved in um, a couple of years ago. So they're not quite there because it's going to be a bespoke product, but we're excited to see how that will work for the city. We also have road sweepers, which have proved to be very successful. Um, and uh, as I mentioned at the start, our two stations, so our council owned Cove station called Aches, which has a lower uh, refueling capacity at 130 kilograms per day, whereas our Kitty Brewster station has that larger 360 kilograms capacity per, per day. Originally built for solely buses, it was re 
um, configured to also be able to do cars and vans in recent years. But our Cove station is solely uh, built for cars and vans with that fast fueling. Both are on green tariffs. <clears throat> We've learned so many lessons, as I'm sure you're aware throughout these projects, not just practicalities to make our pilot projects come on stream quicker, but ultimately for the future of hydrogen fuel, certainly, it needs to be produced through a renewable source. You need to have multiple users to bring the price down at the pump. And of course, at the moment with the energy challenges that you know the, the whole country, the world is facing, that's ever more present on our agenda um, and will be key when working with our joint venture partner. So we're, our JV uh, partner is called um, the Aberdeen Hydrogen Hub. Um, it's a, a project that will be delivered in three phases. Phase one will be looking at a large scale uh, renewably produced hydrogen uh, supply to add to our two stations in the city. Second phase will be lo looking at increasing our, our demand profile uh, and as I mentioned earlier, around different mediums. So looking at the trains, more trucks, marine, HGVs. Um, and the ambitions longer term are for large scale export. So to tie in, as I said, to Aberdeen's strengths, to its physical assets that are already there in terms of pipelines and connections, both to the north of Scotland and the EU and, and globally. Um, <clears throat> Another key important point, as I'll, I'll finish now, sorry, I've gone on a bit long, um, is to have support internally. That's been one of our, our lessons as well. So we're very lucky to have political support, managerial support, and, um, and key stakeholders regionally. And we're trying to do a lot of work around our communications now to really ramp that up. Our focus over the past decade has been about delivering and not shouting about what we've delivered and now we're ready to shout. Thank you very much for your time. Brilliant, thank you so much Emma, it's really interesting. I, I guess that is one of the key things we're gonna hear throughout the conference is the need to have that kind of support, but also more, just as importantly like the comms is, and that, that's what councils aren't traditionally very good at. And it is a matter of really trying to, to help <laughs> um, get to get that support from your comms team to push out everything because because we need to share that knowledge and experience. Right, I've got a couple of questions here. So I'm gonna start um, by asking, um, let me just see, because I put them all on a piece of paper. Kate, Kate Wood, would you like to come on screen? Um, just, you've got to just, it says, ask to share your audio and video. If you want to do that, then come on, otherwise I can ask you a question for you. I don't know if that's easy enough. Let me just let me just see if I'm, I'm telling you the right thing. Yeah, it is. OK, I'm just going to ask. Um, <laughs> oh, no, sorry. Right. Um, yes, yeah, so it's click, you click your share audio and vid video button. And, and but you, you, if you can't, I'll just say that. What challenge was, Kate says, did you overcome um, across the early stages of your, your implementation. So what challenges did, did you have and how did you overcome them? Um, a lot of challenges. Internally, I think um, a bit of resistance, especially because we were going to put you know, assets on council depot and it was new. And of course, people associated hydrogen with bombs and blowing up. So the safety element was a challenge, for example. Um, but that's where communication you know, came in uh, to play its part and we worked very closely with the unions for example um, but there was a lot of physical challenges as well finding a location you know for that first refueling station and um, finding land that was suitable obviously you've got to have a certain level of um, space around it for potential blast zones and that but actually where our um, station is situated it is in a residential area also with our of course um, council offices and it has a railway line next to it as well so going through the planning process and um, it takes time so um yeah that was probably our, our biggest considerations as i'd say 
Cool. And um, there's been a lot in the chat about um, renewable um, sources. And if you're using green hydrogen, basically, which you have said you, you are um, using a green tariff, um, but are you you're looking to get green green hydrogen supply locally? Yes, if we can, if we can tie it in, that's certainly something that we want to do with our uh, joint venture partner, definitely. Um, we wanted to do that for the first uh, station. It was going to be situated at a different location, but we couldn't um, we couldn't get the wind turbines passed because of the, the flight path. That's another consideration of location as well, if you're linking it in with renewables, and then it needs to be in an operationally efficient location, depending on your users, of course. Great. Um, there's been also people asking about pointing the way in relation to resources, um, both from educational perspective, but also just people interested in, in knowing more. Um, I popped on a, a, a web a web link, but if you could, if there's a different one that you think is more useful, then if you could pop it in the chat, that would be fantastic, Emma. Um, and then I'm going to ask. Um, let me just see who's next on my list. Um, and maybe Julie, on the education part. That's definitely yeah. part of our program as well and Aberdeen College are running a hydrogen training course and that's something that's been developed through one of our projects. So you're working with the, with, um, the local education, tertiary education, higher education? Yeah, yeah. and in fact we um, gifted them one of the Van Hools when they came to their end of life. Um, they, they use one for um, you know practical learning, not just theoretical. That's really that, that's really cool, right, Julie? If you'd like to try, you just click the share button. It should be in the kind of top right of the of the screen with our faces on it, basically, and come to the moderation um, panel. I know that Andrew's there. That's it. Oh, that's Wendy on it, but that's okay too, um, because you've got a question as well. You've got in the chat. Um, if you can't do that, Julie, then I can ask the question and then I'll go to some people that are, are sitting here. OK, so Julie's got a few questions, but I think we've pretty much sorted the the, the fossil fuels one um, and information one. But she's asking, do you have public support for hydrogen? Um, yes, I mean, that, again, was a, a challenge and that's something we've worked on from the start, especially because the public were the test bed for that first product. But um, we did a lot of communications around that because ultimately the customers wanted to know that the product was safe and it would get them from A to B on their journey and not cost them any more. And of course, First and Stagecoach had their obligations under their operator license as well. So we did a lot of communications. But, you know, in all honesty, we've had a lot of um, requests for FOIs, you know, um, how much did the projects cost and how much was spent and um, and we've been very honest around that, that it's expensive, but that's the benefit of local authorities trialling these technologies um, before they, they can go commercial. So, yeah, we've, we've worked very hard to bring the, the public on board. And actually now with our um, car club co-wheels, um, the public can rent hydrogen vehicles and use them themselves. It is a really good way actually using co-wheels co co or, you know, your kind of um, those kind of things because they have electric cars and hydrogen as well. Um, yeah. I do remember having them at Climate Cafe once and um, and the director of co-wheels was like, yeah, the hydrogen's great. And I was like, but we're doing it about electric cars. But he just loved the hydrogen car. <laughs> but uh, yeah, but that, that's really it's really interesting. Um, I like to say that I, I live in a hydrogen bus route and I don't think it's an issue for anybody using it. And everyone everyone's absolutely fine. Um, okay, so I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to invite um, Wendy to say her question just for a bit of a shake shake up. So Wendy's about to come on to. Oh, I thought she was, <sighs> but it doesn't seem to be working. Okay, I'm going to try Andrew and see if that works. Andrew. Mm. Oh, here we go! Yay, <laughs> Andrew, it works. Um, it's working. Having a bit of trouble with technology myself um thanks I, uh, I think i might have missed some of the sessions apologies emma um uh, i guess one question that comes to mind is uh, is the project stimulating industry to is it to is it stimulating industry to actually uh, 
advance the uh, tech, advanced technology, uh, move into these different uh, processes, different uh, uh, modes of transport, um, and uh, just what, how, how are you going about that? So sort of, that's that's the thrust yeah. of it. <laughs> yeah, no, it definitely is. Um... And, and we found that uh, over definitely over the past few years, especially as this energy transition, um, you know, uh, has become the focus for, you know, all governments. So and then hydrogen is just over the past few years, absolutely just become so high on the agenda and in policy and strategy. But what we found, yes, uh, locally, a lot of companies are, are desperate to get into the sector and work with us. And that's why we thought now's the time to enter into a joint venture partnership. So as I mentioned, you, you, you maybe missed it, but we're towards the end of that process. So at the end of October, there'll be a, a very large announcement from the council in terms of partnering with a private sector organization uh, to really develop the sector. And that will be, I mean, it's called the hydrogen hub, but it will be pilot projects, more pilot projects, physical assets, but longer term, the, the, the big prize is, is export. And the unique position Aberdeen's been in to, to do this joint venture is because we've been building our level of demand over so many years to have that demand because it's that chicken and egg supply and demand, isn't it? So, um, you know, that that's where our, our, the benefit is of someone partnering with Aberdeen at this stage. That, 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 that's fantastic. I hope. Okay. Oh. Yeah. Alison's yeah, trying Alison. to speak. Uh, okay. Oh. Wait, wait a minute. That always has to happen. We've got it open done with me, which is great. I was like, <laughs> thank you. Angie, if you just want to click the leave button and then we can get, get someone else on it. It doesn't take you out of the session, just takes you off this bit. Um, Emma, we've had quite a lot of chat on, on the chat about yeah. um how uh, maybe Aberdeen's in quite a unique position? Is it really possible for other areas to do it? And is there any funding available at the moment from the UK government to, to kind of take what you do and transplant to other places within the UK? And um, certainly Scottish government. Um, yeah, I mean, we're working closely with the Scottish government. There are various funding pots that, um, you know, we're looking to draw from, you know, we've made various applications as well, and they're open to any region. Uh, we, uh, I, I guess where we are as well, we'd like to support other regions, you know, ultimately we know how hard it can be to get cost effective hydrogen and to really start your project. So ultimately, if we can be in a position where we can get that larger scale supply and supply it to other regions and help them mobilise, you know, we'd really like to be in a position to do that in the coming years. Oh, well, that's great. Um... Because I think that's that's necessary, that kind of help, isn't it? And that's part of why we're doing this conference to kind of get people kind of understanding what needs to be. And also, if you can link in, then obviously it makes it much more attractive. So the more that goes locally and regionally is really crucial. Definitely, that's we're looking beyond the city limits now. Yeah. Okay, so I've got I've got a question from Alex. Um, apart from the substantial initial cost in procuring hydrogen buses, can you give feedback on the running and maintenance costs compared to standard diesel buses? Yeah, um, I mean, the first bus fleet, in, in all honesty, that's why we couldn't continue running them. It was very expensive. There's some very expensive components um, on there. So it's not just, the, you know, the the uh, the capital purchase price. Yeah, that's that's very important. Um, but the the buses that we now have, the double deckers, they're I can't remember. I think almost like eighty percent a diesel bus, if that makes sense. So the supply chain is there for parts, um, and um, the the maintenance is not as expensive as it, it was for the first project. But yeah, that's definitely an area that that needs to be looked at. Great. And from um, Wendy, she was asking about um, what percentage of the current bus fleet, um, so I think that would be first bus, is is hydrogen. And also in relation to the stagecoach elements, the rural elements, um, what is the feedback from stagecoach in relation to overcoming rural route challenges? 
Yes. Um, so first then, ooh, percentage, not sure, maybe 10% at the moment. I think they, they'd be willing to go up to 50% in terms of hydrogen vehicles. They're also still looking at electric because electric might probably still will provide a solution for city, some city centre routes. But those longer journeys, um, actually hydrogen far outweighs the benefits of electric. And certainly for stagecoach, you know, we'd like to work with them again, of course. And um, the rural routes and um, the, the, the challenge is, is fuel consumption, you know, on hills, for example, um, it can challenge the, the vehicle. Um, and so we did see different consumption from city and rural usage. Um, and then I, I guess you've got to consider the length of the vehicle, for example, as well. You know, at, at one stage, Orkney were interested in taking, you know, trialling our, our single deckers, Van Hools, but they're, they're too long for their tighter country roads. So these sorts of practicalities, I guess. Yeah, you have to think of the practicalities and also, I suppose, the kind of more demand there is for these kind of vehicles and the more different kind of vehicles you have to, to overcome so, some of these challenges, too. Yeah. Um, so that leads us on very nicely to Catherine Jackson's um, question. Have you done any trials or comparisons with battery only options, the various types of vehicles, particularly at the smaller scale end, uh, in, for example, cars and cargo bikes? Yes, we will have. I mean, I, I can't think of the results immediately, but yes, we, we, we've done that sort of comparison. I'm sure we've got reports that I can circulate. Great. And Alice Gregory Morris asks, what are, what is the carbon footprint difference in terms of past fuel and creation of use of hydrogen? Has whole life cycle been considered, such as the creation of the buses and the, and the hydrogen equipment and expected waste and transport? Any information on that would be really useful. Yeah, no, that's probably something we'll need to look into um, in a bit more depth. But certainly when we uh, produce our emission savings uh, for the fleet, and report to the Scottish Government each year, it is looking at that well to wheel uh, situation. So it's not as simple as, you know, how much CO2 the buses themselves um, reduce on the streets. So, but yeah, that, I mean, that's an absolutely valid point in, in all of the renewable sector, isn't it? You know, I mean, I think there's graveyards for wind turbines. So um, yeah, it's... And I guess it's I mean it's important to say that in Scotland that that local authorities have to report in relation to carbon um, emissions. Yeah. And, and where can people find that information? So where can people find those reports? On the council website. Okay, great. Yeah. Okay, and there is also a website you can find out where all the council's um, reports are. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And where is that? Do you know, Emma? Well, on the council website. It would be under the committee. Okay. I'll see if I can find that at some point yeah. and pop it into the main chat as well because it might be useful for people. Um, okay. If Is not, I can, I can I, I obviously work with a colleague. I can find a specific link if, if that's helpful. After. Um, Kate, Kate Wood asks, Is there any chance you can share the presentation with us after the, the session? Yeah. Great. Um, also, remember that all the recordings will be available after on the website, probably by the end of next week. Um, so Steve Guppy says, we have an interest from investors to bring green hydrogen to his area, um, but difficulty finding customers. So it's, it's that kind of um, demand, isn't it? Energy is still too expensive. There's low, It's still more interest in electrification. Um, any advice on securing traction for hydrogen in an area? So creating that kind of critical mass? Well, I would, I don't know, and this is just a personal view, but if you've got that interest and you can make, you know, mobilize that quickly I would look to partner with another region potentially and um, you know that maybe does have that level of demand but is struggling with the supply and I guess what you said in, in your presentation too Emma, was that you, you have to look at other like how you can use hydrogen in quite creative ways within your region and yeah. and really bring in that partnership in in relation to commercial partnerships too yes yeah definitely that's cool. OK, so Fiona Berry asks, what is the range of rurally deployed buses before needing to refuel at one of the city depots? Um, oh, I can't, the, yeah. They can do their full route, basically. Yeah, they don't need to refuel throughout their service, whether in the city or um, or in a rural route. 
and they would refuel once a day. So Stagecoach would have their refueling window uh, first thing in the morning and first would have their refueling window last thing in the evening. Um, but no, there, there's no there's no need to, to stop and refuel. And how long are the journeys in within Aberdeen Charities, Aberdeen City? Um, it depends. Uh, Aberdeen Charities are very it's large. large. <laughs> yeah, region. Um, like, I mean, like, like the number 10 bus, I think, can go all the way to, to Inverness. So that's, what, 90, 90 to 100 miles yeah. back. So yeah. it's, it's quite it's quite considerable distances. Yeah, I um, think it's around know. 260 kilometres the buses can do on a full tank, I think. Great. Yeah. It's OK. We we'll, won't we'll, 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 we'll hold you to that. Um, so let me see. Do you see any positive signs that the UK government is starting to take yeah. hydrogen seriously? Is there any prospect for other local authorities being able to afford to trial hydrogen in their own large vehicle fleets? Are any other local authorities doing so currently? So it's a little bit similar to the question I had before, but maybe you could answer about the kind of other LAs. Yeah, we definitely feel like it's on both Scottish and UK government's agenda that hydrogen is one key part of the energy transition movement and climate change solutions definitely um in terms of i mean what we've done to uh previously with other cities interested in hydrogen but maybe um <clears throat> just want to trial a vehicle we've we've offered that before as well um it, it is difficult though with the the supply situation but um something else we're looking to to get in the city is a mobile refueler which again is something we'd maybe want to use to support other uh, partners nationally if they're in that situation that they they're not sure but would like to trial it we can you know lend a vehicle lend a mobile refueler potentially that's great and i guess that adds into what what you think the critical mass of infrastructure is 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 there i mean you said you need two refueling um, <clears throat> stations. is there anything else that you would say you really need to Get it, get it, going. it needs a network of stations, doesn't it, throughout Scotland? Um, you know, that's why I think, you know, definitely we're looking um, with our uh, fleet and infrastructure feasibilities at where we can strategically locate um, refueling hubs, essentially. And, and then that's where the supply chain comes in, because we want to we would want to go with one uh, procurement you know we'd want to work with Aberdeenshire with Maori with Highlands and, and do one procurement around fleet and one procurement around refueling hubs so that it's one provider it's one maintenance contract because as I mentioned it's the supply chain that can be challenging you know you've got a lot of software considerations when dispensing and things do go wrong um, and you need a company that's able to quickly mobilize and, and quite honestly Brexit hasn't helped that situation either with people now needing to get work permits can't just jump on a plane and, and come and fix things as quickly as they used to be able to that's great we've got time for one more question and what i see is this whole is one oh where is it now it's about using um the buses as storage because obviously there's some kind of um trials about using electric cars as storage but is it um i'm trying to find it in in, in it too in this now um it's always difficult yes so it's Marcus Bailey. Can Emma comment on the view that um, hydrogen is a great way to store and then use excess energy produced from renewable sources, but from an emissions perspective, makes no sense if hydrogen is produced from fossil fuels? Yeah. Yeah, I guess. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I mean, I think that's kind of obvious. If we're going to have, there's no such thing as, I'm going to as blue hydrogen yet, yeah, really effectively. So um, the only way that you can make low carbon or no carbon hydrogen at the moment is by using green um, and really hydrogen isn't a very efficient way of using energy so if you can electrify it's a good idea but it is efficient in the sense of if you've got extra energy um, yeah. yeah so anyway that's brought us neatly to the end sorry marcus um We'll have to finish up here because it's quarter past. Um, but please do go and visit Expo Booths, have a cup of tea, um, network, do the speed dating. It's a lot of fun. Um, mm -hmm. And then come back. And I'm just going to look at the program quickly so I can get it completely right. Come back at 10.30 to the main stage for the organizers address. And then the second workshops are at 10.40. Um, and if you're interested in, in transport, then it will be Nottingham that you want to go to. 
Um, but thank you so much to our wonderful speaker, Emma, and thank you to all of you who have taken part. It's been it's been great. I hope you really enjoyed it. Um, remember to fill in the feedback forms at the end to let us know how much you liked it or anything else you can add to help us constructively get better the next time. But anyway, I will lovely leave you here and say goodbye for now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye bye.